10 standard icsc chemistry viradhalal chapter 1 periodic table periodic properties and variations of those properties this is the modern periodic table it's the culmination of centuries of knowledge accumulation by various scientists all in one snapshot the known universe is made up of these 118 elements imagine their permutations and combinations make up everything from the stars, the supernovas, to the human cell, your bones, your heart, the Earth, Europa, the Moon, and all other asteroids and planets and heavenly bodies. The universe initially had just simple elements. The early universe had hydrogen, the simplest element, atomic number one, one proton and one electron orbiting it. No neutrons, so the mass number is also one. Then, due to gravity, hydrogen gas, they collided with each other to form helium by a process called nuclear fusion, which released a lot of energy. And that's how stars were born. And further fusion happened. Hydrogen, helium combined further to form the heavier elements. Lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, neon, and so on. Well, you should know the first 20 elements by heart for school level. The heavier elements are formed in a more complex way, usually during the death of a star. Every element in your body, be it oxygen or carbon, or phosphorus or calcium was born in a dying star. Yes, you are stardust, quite literally. Or to put it in another way, you are made up of the garbage, the remnants of a dead star. Many of these elements have properties similar to each other. So they have been placed in groups. I can see 18 groups here. And we have seven horizontal periods. Earlier, the group number was with Roman numbers. But now we have the usual ones. Group 1 is called the alkali group. The metals are alkali metals. Hydrogen is not an alkali metal. It doesn't even have a fixed position. It has properties like group 1 elements, but it also has properties like group 17 elements, the halogens. So that's a drawback with this periodic table, but not a big deal. These metals are highly reactive. They all have valency 1. You see the group number tells us the valence electrons. So lithium, atomic number is 3. So its electronic configuration is 2,1. Sodium, 2,8,1, atomic number 11. 23 is a mass number. That means number of neutrons will be 12. Number of protons is 11. Atomic number is a more fundamental property of an element, not atomic mass number or atomic weight. Because atomic number will define the number of electrons in the neutral atom which will decide the electronic configuration, which decides the valency and all chemical properties depend on valencies and electronic configuration. Atomic mass number is not so significant in chemical properties. They do impact the physical properties like boiling point, density, etc. But not the chemical properties. In fact, the same element may have different atomic masses. They are called isotopes, which exist because number of neutrons may not be fixed. We may have sodium 24 as well, who will still have atomic number 11 and still have valency 1 and still behave like an alkali metal, but maybe slightly heavier. Potassium 19, so can you tell me what will be the electronic configuration? Yes, 2,8,8,1. Though the third shell can accommodate up to 18 electrons, but if it's a last shell, it can never have more than 8 electrons. That's the octet rule. So all of them can easily lose one electron to become stable, like the nearest noble gas, and have a complete outermost shell. All of them would like to complete their octet. Of course, lithium would like to have a duplet. That is just two electrons in its first shell, which is the last shell. So it would be like helium. Since they lose electrons, they are good metals. They are good reducing agents. But as we go from left to right, the metallic property decreases. So alkaline earth metals, that is group 2, are also very reactive, but slightly less reactive compared to alkali metals because they will have to lose two electrons to become stable. So even they are reducing agents and they are metallic. Some numbers, atomic masses are in brackets because it's not yet a certain with perfection, you see the heavier elements are radioactive, so it's very difficult to study their properties. You can see that initially the number of protons and neutrons were almost same, like magnesium 12 and 12, sodium 11 and 12. Yeah, when the number of protons are odd, then the neutrons tend to be one extra, which is fine. But the heavier elements, their n upon p ratio, that is the number of neutrons upon number of protons, is greater than one, far greater than one. I mean, you look at uranium number of neutrons is much, much more than number of protons, making it very radioactive and unstable. Uranium is uh, perhaps the heaviest element found naturally on Earth. 
After that, all the remaining elements are not found naturally. They have been prepared artificially in the lab by nuclear reactions and they don't exist for a long time. They exist for a few seconds or a few minutes, so we can't really ascertain their properties. That is why we can't say that, let's say, 117 tennessine is a halogen. It should be, theoretically, but practically there is no evidence yet. We can't observe its reactions because it cannot exist as tennessine. It will break down by nuclear fission into smaller elements. Nuclear reactions will be taught in physics chapter 12. They are pretty interesting, just like chemical reactions are. The last element discovered was 118 organism. Its mass number is yet not ascertained. And we can't be really sure if it's uh, belonging to group 18 perfectly and is a noble gas like them because it exists for a very short time. Group 18 are also called inert gases or noble gases because their duplet or their octet is complete. They will not react under normal circumstances. Obviously, the heavier noble gases can be forced to react under extreme conditions of temperature and pressure, but normally they don't react at all. Group 17, well, they are all halogens, that is salt generator, fluorine, fluorine, bromine, iodine, acetine is radioactive. So all of them are non-metals because they can easily accept an electron to become stable. Fluorine, atomic number 9, so what's the electronic configuration? 2,7. So it would like to be 2,8 like neon, it will gain an electron. They are all oxidizing agents. Chlorine, 2,8,7 and so on. All of them have 7 valence electrons. The group number gives us an indication about the valence electrons. So group 2 will have 2 valence electrons. Then we jump to group 13. 3 valence electrons. So aluminum, 2,8,3, 3 valence electrons. Boron, 2,3, 3 valence electrons. 14, 4 valence electrons. 15, 5, 16, 6. See, when I say that oxygen has 6 valence electrons, it means its valency is 2. Because its electronic configuration is 2,6. So it will require 2 more electrons to become stable. So don't be confused between valence electrons and valency. So how many valence electrons are there here? Eight, except helium, its valence electrons is two, but valency is zero. So it's also called zero group according to the old system. Now, what about the groups three to 12? I just skipped it when I was discussing about valency. Well, these are not normal elements. One, two, and then we directly jump to 13. I can see a gap in the first two periods, in the first three periods, in fact. The transition elements show a transition from the metallic property on the left to non-metallic property on the right. For example, in period 3, sodium is the most reactive metal. Magnesium a little less. Aluminum, less reactive metal. Silicon is in fact a metalloid. All the brown ones are metalloids which have properties of both metals and non-metals. Then phosphorus is a non-metal, sulfur non-metal. Chlorine is a, the most non-metallic element in period 3. And argon is a noble gas, so we won't talk about that in this trend. But some scientists may consider this as well as a non-metallic element. But the most non-metallic element in period 3 is chlorine. The most non-metallic element in the entire periodic table is fluorine. It's such a small atom, just two shells. It would easily take one electron. And the most metallic element is diagonally opposite, cesium. Theoretically, it should be francium, but again, it's radioactive. It doesn't exist for a long time, so we cannot experimentally see its properties. So the crown for the most metallic element the most electropositive metal is for cesium. So down the group, metallic property increases. Sodium is more metallic. Potassium is even more metallic. Rubidium is very violently metallic. If you put all of them in water, and there are YouTube videos to show that, you will notice how, as you go down the group, the reaction becomes more and more exothermic. Let's see what happens when potassium is added to water. Oh, that's a violent explosion. And what if francium were added? Well, that's, that's fake. Now the reason why these elements are called alkali and alkaline earth metals is that their oxides and hydroxides form alkalis. That is when dissolved in water, they behave like strong bases. They turn the litmus paper blue. Non-metallic oxides, on the other hand, are acidic. There are a few exceptions. You'll study them in detail in the chapter Acids, Bases and Salts. Now we can see that most of the elements in the periodic table are metals. All these blue elements are metals. Very few non-metals exist in the top right corner and very few metalloids as well. But as you go down a group, notice that the non-metallic character decreases. And that is why fluorine is the most non-metallic element among the halogens. In fact, the entire table. So a question can be asked in exam. They will just give you random elements, something like sulfur, oxygen, selenium and tellurium arrange in the increasing order of non-metallic property. So the answer would be 
tellurium, selenium, sulfur, and oxygen. So such application-based questions will be asked in exams, and you need to be trained for that, which will be done by solving exercises thoroughly for homework and clearing all your doubts regularly. What else do we see? What is strange about these transition elements, unlike these normal elements, is that they have variable valency because they lose electrons not only from their last shell, but even the penultimate, that is the second last shell. For example, we know that copper can be cuprous or cupric. It is sometimes stable by losing one electron and sometimes by two electrons. You see, after element number 20, the rules of stability become more complex. Octet and duplet are no longer enough to explain their behavior. But that is outside the scope of school syllabus. You will study them in detail in college. Notice again that after 56, after 57, we have element 72 directly. So in between, there are 14 elements missing. Where are they? Well, just like when you forget to write a point in your answer, you make an asterisk sign and you write it at the bottom or you use arrows. By the way, I won't allow that in tests. So similarly here, 14 elements in between them have been placed at the bottom and they are called the lanthanide series because they are after the element lanthanum. And all of them have properties similar to lanthanum. All of them belong to group number three and period number six. But since we can't fit 15 elements in the same box, hence we have mentioned them down. Of course, I have a simple solution to this, uh, a three-dimensional periodic table where all the 15 elements make a tower here. I had presented this idea to the IUPAC, the international chemistry body, but there was a problem. When you open the book like a jack-in-the-box, the 15 elements would just pop up and scare the students. So my idea was rejected. I was this close to winning the Nobel Prize. But still, this modern periodic table has a few defects. For example, I see some gaps here. The inner transition elements, they are kept at the bottom. Actinide series, all of them belong to group number three and period number seven. Because they're all similar to actinium. They're all radioactive elements, by the way. And these are called rare earth elements, very rare and precious. Now, I have a solution to the various problems of the modern periodic table. A new kind of periodic table something like this. It's so elegant. Of course, I won't present it to the IUPAC. They are biased against me, so maybe one of you will get this honor. And when you win the Nobel Prize, give me a shout out on stage. Imagine the next element, the 119th element in period number 8 will be named after you. And just hear the sound of that name in your mind. One more interesting use of the periodic table is that the period number tells us the number of shells in the element. For example, calcium 20, so 2, 8, 2, 4 shells, so period number 4. So just by knowing the atomic number, we can think about the group number and period number, even though we don't have the table handy. And the opposite is also true. If I give you the group number and the period number, you can ascertain where it is, what will be the atomic number, and what will be its properties. And that's the whole reason we have made this table. It becomes easy to understand and remember the properties of the elements because they are clubbed together. Just like in biology, the animal, plant and microbe species are clubbed into groups and kingdoms and phyla. So, now we can begin with the chapter. The first page is just introduction. It's a revision of nine standards, so now it's not in syllabus, but it's good to know the names of the various scientists who helped in developing the modern periodic table gradually. It started with Dobrynas triads, which failed, the Newton's octaves, and the Mendeleev's periodic table, he was the father of the periodic table, but he used atomic weights, not atomic numbers, due to which there were some defects. And then Mosley suggested, let's use atomic numbers, and then it laid the foundation of the modern table. And even the periodic law was modified, so now the law says, physical and chemical properties of elements are periodic functions of their atomic number. Periodic functions means that the physical and chemical properties are repeated periodically and are related to the atomic number. So if we arrange the elements as per their atomic numbers, then we will see a repetition in their physical and chemical properties. For example, alkali metal, alkaline earth metal, metalloid, non-metal, halogen, noble gas, alkali metal, and so on, again alkali metal. So there's a repetition in valency and in chemical properties, all because they're arranged in the increasing order of atomic number. Now some salient features, it means the main features, the position of the element, it is correlated to its electronic configuration. There are seven periods and 18 groups, and each period is completed logically. It always begins with an element having one valence electron, like lithium, and it always ends with a noble gas. 
with completely filled outer shell. A transition from metallic to non-metallic character is seen from left to right. Now mark this as a give reason. Why do elements of the same group have the same properties or similar properties? Because they have the same outer electronic configuration. The rest of the details I've already explained. Now in the periodic table, which is the shortest group? Clearly. I mean, which is the shortest period? It is period number one. Clearly, because it has only two elements. And period two and period three have eight elements each. Period four and five have 18 elements each. Period six and seven have 32 elements each. They are the longest periods. Next, now mark the definition of periods. Just add something here in the modern periodic table. That should be part of the definition. Shortest, short, short, long, long, long. The longest, period six and seven. 32 elements each. Correct it, it's 32. This is old information. Every year they come up with a new edition book, which is a farce because they don't make any changes. Maybe just add some new questions, more questions in the exercise, but the data is still wrong. We have discovered elements still 118, and that element is organazon. So correct this as well. In fact, 112th element has been named properly. It's copernicium. Now there's something special here, bridge elements. Now, lithium should have properties similar to sodium because they belong to the same group. Similarly, beryllium should be like magnesium. Boron should be like aluminum. But surprisingly, boron is more similar to silicon. Beryllium is more similar to aluminum. Lithium is more similar to magnesium. It's like you are quite different from your parents and you are more similar to your neighbor. What does that mean? It means that you are a bridge element. This happens only in period two. So mark the definition. They show similarities and properties diagonally with the period of the next group. This is because of their small atomic size. For example, now lithium is 2,1, so it has valency 1. It should be able to lose the electron very easily, but it has only two shells. Because of its small size, the second shell, the last shell, is so close to the nucleus that the nuclear pull on the electron is quite strong and it is not so easy to lose the electron as you thought it would be, not as easy as sodium. So it becomes slightly less metallic, like magnesium. Similarly, boron has three valence electrons. So you may think it should be a metal, but no, it's a metalloid. It's slightly non-metallic because it doesn't lose the three electrons so easily. Sometimes it may just share electrons to form covalent bond because of its small size. So it is less like aluminum and more like silicon. Carbon, phosphorus, nitrogen, sulfur, oxygen, chlorine. That's it. These are the examples of bridge elements. Now, one important topic in this chapter is trends. You should always be aware of the trends in the periodic table, not just in terms of fashion. Now first we'll talk about the trends across a period. From left to right, what do you see? We see the number of electron shells is same. Yeah, in period number two, for example, all of them have two shells. But the valence electrons, they keep on increasing. So here we have three valence electrons, four, five, six, seven, eight valence electrons. By the way, valency increases and then decreases. So valency one, two, three, four, three, two, one, zero. That was valency. From left to right, non-metallic character is increasing and metallic character is decreasing. So in period one, well, we have just two elements. In period two, you can see how valency is changing and how metallic properties decreasing. Boron is a metalloid. Similarly, in period three, silicon is a metalloid. Electropositive character from left to right is decreasing, but electronegative character is increasing. That is non-metallic character is increasing. Non-metallic is electronegative because they easily accept electrons and become negatively charged anions. Let's talk about the compounds of period three elements. Whenever these elements combine with chlorine, they form a chloride. Sodium will form sodium chloride. It's an ionic bond formed by sharing of electrons. No, by transfer of electrons. From a metal, electron is transferred to non-metal. Hence, it's called ionic, also called electrovalent. This happens only between metals and non-metals who have a great electronegativity difference. Magnesium chloride, MgCl2, valency is, remember, Mg is 2 plus and Cl is 1 minus, so crisscross. Aluminum chloride is ionic. It may have some covalent properties as well because it's a weak metal. It will form a polar covalent bond. More about it in the next chapter. But from here onwards, all the bonds are covalent. Silicon is a metalloid, but here it will form a covalent bond. Phosphorus, trichloride, pentachloride are covalent, of course. 
and even sulfur chloride is. Chlorine does not form a compound with chlorine, and noble gases don't even react. The states are not to be learned to cancel them. Now the oxides and hydroxides can either be acidic or basic. Metallic oxides are usually basic. Aluminum oxide hydroxides are amphoteric. That means sometimes uh, basic and sometimes acidic, depending on the reaction. And then the non-metallic oxides are all acidic. So basic property is decreasing and acidic property is increasing. That is why chlorine heptoxide is the most acidic oxide out here. And perchloric acid is the strongest acid out of all of them. And their hydrides also show a similar trend. Now groups, mark the definition of groups. Just cancel this and write off elements. Group 1 are alkali metals. Group 2 alkaline earth metals. Group 3 to 12 are a bit different. They are called transition elements. And within them, we have the lanthanide series and actinide series. Together they are called inner transition elements, which have last three shells incomplete. They are really weird. They have variable valencies, all of them. You don't have to learn all these examples. 13 to 16 are called post-transition elements. 17 are called halogens. And 18 are the noble gases. And details about them are given, which I've already explained. Now, let's talk about trends down the group. Group 1. Notice how all of them have one valence electron. The second last shell has maximum 8 electrons. That's a rule. Third last shell can have maximum 18 electrons, irrespective of what the capacity is. Group 2, all of them have, will have valency 2. Group 13, just cancel it. No need to learn that. Yes, you can learn all the elements of group 1, 2, 17, and 18. Not just the first 20 elements, but even these. Now, group 17, tennessine is radioactive, so we don't really know its properties for sure, but you can just learn them as a part of group 17. So down the group, what remains the same? Number of balanced electrons remain the same. The chemical properties remain similar, and they vary gradually. So, for example, as you go down, the non-metallic property is decreasing. And what changes do we see? Metallic properties increasing down the group. Number of electron shells are also increasing. So definitely the atomic size will also increase. Francium will be bigger than cesium and cesium will be bigger than rubidium. So the smallest atom in the entire periodic table is helium. Just one shell. And yeah, it's uh, smaller than even hydrogen. Because it has two protons which pull the two electrons nearer to it. Now let's differentiate between group 1 and group 17 elements. Let's do a comparative study. First of all, remember the list of elements. Just add tennessine out here, which is not very important from exam point of view. They will never ask you about it. Valency, well, both of them have one valence, one valency, but they have uh, different valence electrons. They have one valence electron and they have seven valence electrons. Both are highly reactive. This is electropositive, electronegative. They're soft metals. Alkali metals can easily be cut with a knife. And they're so reactive that they will react with the atmospheric moisture and oxygen and lose their color and shine. Hence, they are stored in kerosene. But all of them are solids. Halogens? Well, the first two, fluorine and chlorine, are gases. Bromine is liquid. And iodine is solid, a sublimatory solid at room temperature. And the color becomes darker and darker as you go down the group. They are good conductors, but they are bad conductors. They are good reducing agents, mark the give reason, and they are bad reducing agents. And they are strong oxidizing agents, mark the give reason. Uh, write some extra sentence. They have seven valence electrons, so they easily accept an electron. And accepting an electron is called oxidation, uh, no, reduction. And since they take the electron from someone else, they are strong oxidizing agents because they are oxidizing others. They themselves will undergo reduction, but they are oxidizing agents. Similarly, metals are reducing agents because they themselves will undergo oxidation by losing electrons. Electronegativity, its definition will come later in the chapter. They have very low electronegativity. They're electropositive. They like to give electrons. And that property increases down the group. They're selfless people. Halogens are selfish. They're electronegative. They like to snatch electrons. Now, their reactions with nonmetals, well, the alkali metals will react with nonmetals to form ionic compounds. Even with hydrogen, they form ionic hydrides. The metals, that is. The nonmetals will react with other nonmetals. And even with hydrogen to form covalent compounds. Covalent compounds can only be formed between two non-metals because their electronegativity difference is quite low. So they can't transfer electrons. They can only share electrons and sharing is covalency. Now mark the definition of periodicity. The occurrence of certain properties after definite intervals in the table because they are arranged in increasing order of atomic number. 
is called periodicity. And the properties which are seen periodically are called periodic properties. Now that's an example of alliteration. In this chapter, we are going to study five main periodic properties, atomic radii or atomic size, IP, ionization potential, electron affinity, electronegativity, and metallic and non-metallic character. We'll also briefly look at the trends of density, melting point, boiling point, nature of oxides, hydroxides, etc. And what is the reason for this periodicity? Well, as I've explained, that after definite intervals of atomic number, the valence shell electronic configuration repeats itself. And all properties depend on the valence shell electronic configuration. That is why the properties repeat themselves. Now there are five main properties, so mark the definitions. Atomic radius is simply the distance between the center of the nucleus and the outermost shell. It helps us to know the atomic size, which is extremely tiny, to the size of 10 raised to minus 10 meters. Now ionization potential. You see if there is an atom having an electron in the outermost shell, to knock off that electron, some energy is required. So the amount of energy required to remove an electron from the outermost shell of an isolated gaseous atom is called ionization potential, which is measured in electron volt, a very small unit. Why isolated gaseous atom? Well, if I want to compare IP of, let's say, sodium with chlorine, it won't be a fair comparison because chlorine is diatomic and sodium is monoatomic and sodium is in a solid state. So to make the field an even playing ground, we will only compare the IPs by converting the element in isolated gaseous atom state and then we'll calculate the actual energy required to knock off the electron. See, all of these concepts will be taught in detail along with the trends in the second part of the chapter. Right now, let's just familiarize ourselves with the definitions. Electron affinity, well, as the name suggests, it's uh, the affinity for electron, the attraction for electron. It is the amount of energy released when an atom in the isolated gaseous state accepts the electron to form an anion. For example, fluorine, when it accepts an electron, it releases energy, it becomes more stable. So in IP, energy is required to knock the electron off, and EA is the energy released when electron is gained, so they are quite opposite to each other. Now electronegativity. Now imagine there is a covalent bond between hydrogen and chlorine. It's a single covalent bond, they are sharing, so that hydrogen's duplet is complete and chlorine's octet is complete. They can't transfer the electron. Hydrogen is not as selfless and electropositive as sodium, who would just give away the electron and become a cation itself. No, it would share it with chlorine. However, chlorine is more electronegative than hydrogen. It's greedier than hydrogen. So even though for namesake they are sharing, it's not an equally shared pair of electrons. It's not symmetrical. The shared pair of electrons are a little closer to chlorine and far away from hydrogen. More about this will be taught in chapter number two because it has some consequences. By the way, the tendency of an atom, the greediness of an atom to attract electrons to itself when combined in a compound is called electronegativity. And obviously non-metals will be more electronegative than metals. Non-metallic character itself means the ability to gain electrons and metallic character means the ability to lose electrons. Now, how do these properties increase or decrease down the group or across a period and why do they and what are the exceptions will be a matter of discussion in the second part of the chapter. Hi students, this is AJ sir. If you found this video useful, press the like button. Also, if you'd like to enroll for my test series or online lectures, email me or message me on Instagram. Check my description for more information.